Hi, in this video we're going to talk about using AFNI's clusterizing capability in the GUI. I'm here in the home directory and I'm going to change into AFNI data 6 AFNI. And this video is actually a bit of a continuation from a previous video where we looked at displaying statistical results. So we're in this directory and this is the data set of statistical results that we're going to uh, display and threshold. We looked at the information and where this came from, so you can check that, that earlier video if you're interested. I'm going to run the AFNI GUI and go through the, the way that we started thresholding it fairly quickly. So I'm going to overlay the Funk Slim data set, and in this case we're displaying the coefficient or the beta values and we said the range of that for a reasonable task is somewhere around plus or minus 3% for bold percent signal change. And we we're thresholded our data set before. The, the information that we're thresholding is an associated subric. It's just after it, index number 2 here, tstat. And I can right-click here, and before I set the p-value, I can type one in like this. I'll just note if I right click here and come down here, there's set P of 0 0.001 because this value is such a common voxel wise threshold value. So again, the, the magic of being able to specify a P value and threshold my T stat is because the AFNI header contains the degrees of freedom information that are necessary to translate uh, T to significance. And down here, again, I see the P value, it matches. This is the, the T statistic, fine. So this is basically the place that we had gotten to just before. We also noted that if I wanted to threshold, one way I can view it is to turn on the alpha channel for thresholding so that things below threshold are still visible, but they become more and more transparent the further below threshold they are. And I can put a box around things that are really above threshold. So this, this can be useful or, or as, as, you, as you wish. And I'll just point out another uh, fun way to set the, the p-value for thresholding is if I come down here and I use my scroll wheel and scroll, I think, upward, then I get an option to enter a p-value and I can type p of 0 0.001 and there. Okay, so just a hidden shortcut to this kind of thresholding. This is a, what's called a, a first level thresholding, a voxel wise thresholding. If these were results at a, at a group level, um, or even what we would look at in order to control the false positive rate for having so many uh, tests here in parallel, and let me take a step back that what we're talking about is the results here, the t-stat, is for each individual voxel from each model. But we have something like 60,000 voxels inside the brain. So we have a lot of simultaneous tests and what's called a multiple comparisons problem for what's called our massively univariate analysis. So just by thresholding each of these at this significance, we know that we have a lot more false positives here because we have 60,000 tests. So to try to do something to control about that, oftentimes what people do is, is a second kind of ad hoc analysis. It's called clusterizing. And so you would perform uh, some kind of test in order to essentially find a size of clusters whose values make the results more believable. So the idea is some kind of loner voxel like this that has a high statistical result probably I'm not going to believe because it's off by itself. I'm more likely to believe things that happen in clusters because uh, inside the brain, you know, an anatomical region of typically a, a few voxels at least uh, work together to accomplish something. It's usually not just one voxel by itself. Now, there's a huge number of caveats about this because there are very small parts of the brain that... Uh, work uh, on very specific tasks. And so depending on the kind of task that you have, you really have to be careful about where you set thresholds. I'm going to ignore that minefield of discussion for the moment and say, let, let's just take the fact that we're going to uh, threshold this based on a cluster size. Okay, so 
we, we have our first level clustering by, by voxels. Now we want to find basically large enough regions that are connected that we quote unquote believe them or we use that for uh, controlling the false positive rate. So here, there's the clusterize button. And this gives us a pop-up menu where we can specify how many voxels need to be contiguous for us to believe that or to keep it, pass it through this thresholding based on clustering. Now, before we even do that, we need to talk about the NN level or what it means to be a neighbor of a voxel. So when we're forming a cluster, what are the rules that voxels must have to be part of a cluster? This is an option that you can, you can set Right now, the default level is two, and that means that a voxel is a neighbor of another voxel if either their faces or their edges touch. And to view this graphically, you can view it like here. So um, here are three different representations of different neighborhood levels. So for a given voxel, this is a, a face, an edge, and the corner is a node. And typically, the, the default for AFNI uh, used to be, or in some programs were, if, if this central voxel here in, in black is the, the voxel in question, these green voxels around it would be considered its neighbors that touch the faces connect. This is what's called NN1, or nearest neighbor one. The neighborhood of this voxel with NN2, or face plus edge, are these red voxels that share either an edge or a face. And NN3 is this face or edge or node, would be all the blue voxels around this one. And typically, historically, the AFNI default was basically NN1, SPMs was NN2, and FSLs was NN3. This is something where there's really no right or wrong. None of these strikes me as inherently uh, correct over another one. They do have the different properties of different neighborhood sizes. And this provides a, a good cautionary note for mixing and matching across software. If you calculate a cluster threshold in one software and then go to another one and apply it, you have to be careful that the definition of what it means to be a cluster together may have changed. And so you'd see inherent differences. And um, you can see differences of 10 or more percent based on cluster size just because of this nearest neighbor number count. But again, as long as you're consistent, I don't think that there's anything inherently right or wrong about choosing one of these. And as we've just seen, actually, in AFNI, this used to be kind of the default. Now, in a lot of cases, we have NN2, but it's an option, and we like to give users the freedom to select whatever they want to when, when possible. So anyways, in this case, if uh, voxels share face or an edge, then they will be considered neighbors. And fine, so it, right now the default would be if there are 40 voxels or more in a cluster, it would pass through the threshold, otherwise it would be uh, censored out. I'm gonna make this something larger like 200. Where this number comes from is something that you have to calculate. For example, you could use 3D clust sim uh, using the brute force approach of, of simulations of clusters based on the, uh, the noise and smoothness of your data. That's fine. Different software calculate this differently. Again, that's a, a large and separate topic. This by-sided option is one where um, you have to decide whether you would want a cluster. So if, you, if here, if you notice, there's things with large positive values and large negative values that have survived the voxelwise thresholding, should these be considered part of one cluster or should they be separate because one part is positive and one is negative? So if you, if you have by-sided yes, then it means that the, the positive side and the negative side would get thresholded and cluster tested separately. And probably this makes the most sense in AFNI, we, we think that most often the, the default is a, a two-sided um, test. So usually you're, you're testing positive and negative simultaneously, so you still have them here. Um, but typically, it would, it would seem to make more sense if you have a strong positive thing and a strong negative thing. Just because they happen to be contiguous, they shouldn't be considered the same cluster. So I'll leave that as yes. Okay, I'm going to hit set and watch what happens. 
all these little dots and kind of individual things have disappeared. Okay, so now I'm left with larger islands here. Great. Now, if I want to navigate around and see where these clusters are, I can go to this button called RPT for report. I'm going to make it just a little bit larger. And I see that at the moment I have eight clusters that survived. And this tells me the size of them going from largest to smallest, one through eight. And here's a, a representative coordinate. In this case, it is the peak value uh, within each cluster of the overlay. And if I want to jump to, let's say, the peak value for the largest cluster, I can go to this button, jump there. If I want to see where this cluster is in full extent, I can click the flash button. And this is extremely useful because clusters can move in and out of slices and it's, it's pretty amazing. If, here you can see if I scroll down a little bit, it makes more sense of why this is all a, a full cluster together. But this is useful. So jump and then you can flash the cluster. If I want to see the next largest cluster, I can jump to it and flash it. Okay, and onward. Um, it's entirely possible that I that I wouldn't want to jump to the, the peak value. If I want to change that, I could jump to its center of mass. So now that's what this coordinate represents. And if I jump there, now it's interesting, the center of mass for this cluster, this cluster, is not even in the cluster because of its shape. So it's just strictly the center of mass of all these things. The average, must, much like if you took the center of mass of a donut, it's not inside the donut, it would be in the hole. So for that reason, there's also an iCent, which is an isocenter. And if I jump there, it is basically the, um, the point in the cluster, still within the cluster, that is closest to the center of mass. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that you could quote unquote summarize or choose one voxel. In, in general, particularly when you see a cluster this large, it's really hard to summarize it by just one value. And we'll talk more about that with the where am I and how do we want to talk about quote unquote where our cluster is or summarizing our results. Would we want to just report this single value to really represent this entire location? That's, that's doubtful, but that's a separate discussion. I won't rant about that at the moment. Okay, so anyways, I can jump and flash a cluster. Great. Um, if you notice, there's a, a plot button here. If I just click it now, uh, it tells me that I, I don't have data to plot. What would be useful to plot? Well, I have this, this cluster here, and what I might want to know is what is the average time series of this cluster? So that's what could be plotted if I load, as it told me, auxiliary data. So I'm going to go over here, and there's, if I hover, you see it open, close, auxiliary data set selector. So I'm going to select this arrow. It's open. And if I click on augs, now I can select a, a data set to be an auxiliary data set. And in this case, I'm going to choose this, um, I guess I'll choose this one here. RAL VR. So this is uh, Volreg, so motion corrected, all the time series, and there were three time series concatenated. So I'm going to select that. Okay, and now this data set is loaded, fine. I'm just going to close this for space. Now when I go to plot, here we go. This is the average time series in, if I make space for it, in this cluster, that I've been looking at. And if I want to see the average time series in this cluster, I can also plot that. Interestingly, it looks a little bit less interpretable. Uh, this is a, a block design task, so you see there's still some, some baseline motion, but these are the blocks on, 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 off, etc. So, okay, so I can, I have to be careful now where I click, there, I can flash, and that's fine. And if I want to, uh, save this average auxiliary data set to a 1D file. And again, 1D files in AFNI are just basically columns or rows or both of numbers. I could click save. And if you notice in the text here, it, it saved it by default, the uh, cluster one mean. Cluster one is, is basically interpretable here because this 
this one, it just means it's my largest cluster. If I save, let's say here, the time series here, it's cluster five because it's the fifth largest cluster. And that's, this five denotes where the cluster is basically. Okay. And if I take a look at what these, one of these 1D files looks like, it's just a column of numbers. And again, it should be 450 numbers. Okay, let me bring my information back here. Okay, so that's saving that average time series. Great. If I want to save the, the mask of this cluster, then here I can go cluster, fine, output file prefix, and click on save mask. And if you notice again in the GUI, uh, in the terminal, there's this command that popped out. This is the command that AFNI calls. 3D Clusterize is a program in AFNI, and it's taking all the data that I've entered. This was my cluster size. This was the data set, uh, the index of the data set that I was looking at, the index of the threshold data set, my nearest neighbor number, my by-sided choice, and the, the tstat values, etc. And it's saving this data set called cluster mask. And if I type ls minus ltr here, I'll see that indeed I have this cluster mask data set here. And also, it's, it's actually quite handy if I want to know how to use 3D Clusterize well. Here's a great example of, of how to use it. Cool. If I want to now, I could actually look at this data set. So let me just do that quickly. So here is this data set. What I'll do is I'll open up a new controller. And I'll just open up an axial window here. And I'm going to select for the the overlay for this controller to be a new data set will appear at the bottom of the list and it's this cluster mask file. Okay, I see that there is kind of similar coverage but something's a little bit different. Well, if I notice in this data set, the maximum value is eight and the minimum is zero. Huh, I wonder why that is. Well, this cluster mask is not the values stored here. What it is is what I would call a, a map of the clusters. If you notice, the I have eight clusters, and how we define a region of interest or, or map out where ROIs are is by assigning a bunch of voxels the same integer value. And that's what this data set is. So if I change my color bar to something more appropriate to look at ROI values, this will become more clear. So I'm going to right click on this color bar and choose a color scale. And the maximum number is eight, so I can choose ROI I32. And that's fine. And here, now you see this is the ROI kind of color bar, only positive values. And hopefully, it's pretty clear to see that where, um, where this cluster one is flashing, if I, if I click here, the crosshairs are locked, notice that indeed in this overlay data set, this has a value of one. If I flash where cluster two is, if I click here, this purple, indeed it has a value of two. So the integer values that are here, the basically decreasing size of the cluster are represented here. And so now uh, it's nice to have an ROI data set associated with it. I'll just note that in this 3D clusterize command here, uh, this is looked at in detail a little bit more in other cases, I can actually add an option, say minus pref dat, and I can output, let me just call it clust dat, and I'm gonna put a minus overwrite option, overwrite, okay. And now, if you notice, I see the table, it's a little hard to see in my terminal size here. This is the same table that I was just looking at. I can save it with a redirect. Here, I've, I've got this cluster dat file. And uh, if I just look at the 3D info on it quickly here, its values go from minus four to 10, something like that. And if you note it, well, um, 
it's actually the same. It's just the subset of values inside here. So if I if I quickly open up that data set, I guess I've got myself into using a lot of screen space here. If I overlay now this clust dat, you'll see that this data set actually looks exactly like this one. It's just the data values inside where the clustering was. Uh, so I have an A, B, and C controller here. If you notice this in the A and C controllers, it's the same value at the voxel. These are the same data sets. Um, I've really got so many of these open. I'm just going to close this one for the moment for space considerations. Let me go back to this 3D clusterize command that I ran a second ago. If you notice it, it output a table to the terminal, I can redirect that to a file and call it clust report.txt, for example, there. Okay, so now if I look at this information here, I have cluster report.txt. And if I concatenate that, here's my, my table of interest. So I've saved that information. If you notice all these parts, this meta information is very useful. So I can remember at a later date, the exact command that I used to, to get it, basically all the information that went in, the 3D cluster clusterize command that used to make it would be in the header information, the 3D info minus history of either one of these data sets, but all the kind of meta information is here and this tabular information I can, I can use also. So we'll look at that in uh, another lecture. Okay, so this is a lot of the clusterizing information. Some other useful things to note are if I decide, you know what, actually, uh, I, I don't want this particular p-value on a different threshold. As I threshold this data set either higher or lower, it updates automatically here, and the cluster table also uh, updates automatically. And if I wanted to regenerate the fixed data sets on the command line with it, I could just go through and again hit uh, save mask. And now it has a minus overwrite, and this 3D clusterize command made new data sets. Let me shrink the terminals slightly here. It made new data sets with the new thresholding values that I used here. Okay, so essentially, I, if I want to uh, change the threshold, I can, I can update in my report changes and updates automatically, and I could regenerate the plot for my new thread. So let's say I threshold at a much higher level and I jump to this cluster and I plot it. Here's the, the plot now for this new cluster that I have, etc. Okay, so it updates and I can regenerate the files that are saved on the disk too with the, the new commands as, uh, as I would want to. And it, I, these alpha and boxed buttons also apply here. So again, I can still use these to highlight things that pass both thresholds, both the voxel-wise and cluster-wise threshold. And again, I'm, I'm not really hiding data out here. Maybe I have results that are just below threshold out here, and that would seem normal. Maybe I have an artifact out here that now I can see, and so I know how to check something. Again, the, this alpha and box is, is really kind of nice so that you can apply a threshold, but not lose so much information that may be, may be telling you useful things. Okay, thanks.